let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to say that again as we continue finding our way back to our seats. Our call to worship this morning, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's, you know, the rain comes and we think um, a few years ago we were suffering from drought, but how easy it is for us to complain about the rain. But when, when we get sun on a Sunday morning on the way to church after a, a, a hard rain, it's such a beautiful day. And, and we're reminded, and, and the love of the Lord comes, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Um, a quick note on, on the hymns. Every once in a while, somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, why did we sing that hymn? It's unfamiliar to me. Um, and and I, I'm especially more recently, I've been picking the hymns based on what I'm preaching on and, and the words that are contained in them. Usually they're ones that I know. That doesn't mean everybody knows them. But the hymn number is always on the first slide. And if you miss the hymn number, it's always in the bulletin. And there's usually a, hymn number, a hymnal somewhere in the pew. So if it's not as familiar to you, you're more than welcome to pull that hymn, hymnal out of the pew and, and um, sing along reading the notes like I believe most of you know, my generation and your gener these the generations that are represented in the pews, most of us learned some music in school, right? Um, so, so don't be afraid to use those hymnals. Let's rise and sing together hymn number 522, Grace Greater Than Our Sin. Let us confess our sin. Heavenly Father, we come before you to seek your mercy and grace. We have sinned against you and against ourselves with our wrong attitudes of selfishness and pride. We have not followed completely what you have told us in your word, 
and have at times even rebelled against your ways. We are sorry. We seek your forgiveness and cleansing through your Son, Jesus Christ, to whom all praise and glory will be given. In his name, amen. The declaration of grace for today is from Romans chapter 6, verse 22 to 23. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our faith using the words of the, nice, of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 11. Please read responsively. Um, I'll start with the light print. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. Our epistle this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. 
But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol is no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat it, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother of whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. gospel for today is from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him, and they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. Here ends the reading of God's word. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word as your word is truth. We pray, Lord, that our eyes and our hearts and our minds would be open to what your word has to tell us today. And that as we receive it, it can build up faith within us that we can also be sharing that faith with the world around us. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, again, I'm not preaching on the gospel lesson today. I'm continuing on our, um, our journey through the five solas of the Reformation. We have covered, uh, um, well, where was it? Word alone and Christ alone, and now we're moving into grace alone. And then next week is faith alone, and the final week is glory to God alone. And let me say, just in preparation for this, it is very difficult to separate all of these things into individual categories, because they all rely on each other and depend on each other and need each other. That's why there's five of them, is you really need all five. But grace and faith, especially, are, 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 are difficult to separate so I'm going to try and 
focus on the word grace and what it means that God has grace for us um, in, in this grace alone message. I'm reminded of what I learned. I, I believe I was in maybe high school youth group the first time I heard somebody say this. But if, if grace is an acronym, G-R-A-C-E, it could stand for God's riches at Christ's expense. I don't know if you've heard that or not before, but it, it's, it's a wonderful little thing to remind us that all of the good things that God has, his riches have been given to us, and the cost to give them was Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. So God's riches at Christ's expense, and that will come up a few times during this message. Um, another thing that I wanted to consider as I focused on grace was is the idea that, and I, I don't remember where I first heard it. There was a song I used to really like, and I don't even remember the song, but the words, the phrase, fall from grace were in this song. And um, the idea that we can fall from God's grace is probably ingrained in me through Lutheran theology, but um, also through just my sin nature, you know. And um, I remember, and I don't remember the passage it was from, but I remember preaching a sermon years ago, and I remember reading, it, the, it was R.C.H. Linsky's commentary on, on this idea of falling from grace, and he gave this beautiful picture. I don't know if it's beautiful or not, but it's a very descriptive picture. If you picture a very large tripod... And at the top of the tripod is a rope coming down to you, and it's holding you up. So you are sus suspended by a rope. That rope is God's grace that is holding you. And below you is the eternal abyss of the pit of hell, right? And God's grace is holding you from falling to that. And yet what we do with our sin nature is not God, but we have a knife. And we sit there and we sin and we cut away at this cord that is holding us up. And that's God's grace because of our own sin nature. And, and sometimes we don't think our sin is that dangerous. We don't think our sin hurts the people around us. We think, oh, we can hide it so it only affects ourselves. But we have this thing called free will and we are sinners and we do do things, I do, I have talked to enough people in the world, I kind of assume that everybody understands this, every once in a while you come across somebody, oh not me, I would never, but, but if we're honest, we cut away at this cord, we cut away at this cord, and eventually enough sin, we will cut through that cord, and, and that's I bring that up as the, the negative side of what sin does to grace so that grace means more for us when we understand it. Um, today's passages are going to be from Ephesians and Romans. I'm going to start with Ephesians chapter 2. Is Steve here? Where's Steve? Where's, Steve? Where's the den? They're not, there, there he is. See, my eyes are working great. Steve loves this verse because I always leave out his favorite verse at the end, which I'm going to include today. But it's also going to be brought up again in two weeks when we talk about glory to God alone. This is going to be, this is, again, grace and faith and glory to God are all just compacted in here where it's hard to separate. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, and I want to begin here, and this talks about our condition as sinners, and with verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out our desires of the body and the mind. And but we were and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind cutting away at that cord, that cord that is the grace that holds us out of falling into hell. Verse 4 has, and there's a few of these today, a, a holy but, okay? I, I, I love, you, you have this, you're a horrible, evil, bad person, but, 
Verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with grace. But with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. Made us alive together with Christ, by grace, you have been saved. Um, so grace, if we look at these verses, it, it's a mode of our salvation. It is how our salvation comes to us, and it's God's part in how our salvation comes to us. It's, it's how you get to heaven, okay? And, and the how part of how you get to heaven is focused on, on not exactly what God does, but the fact that God is willing to do something to get you to heaven. It, it, it describes who God is as a God, as a person, and, and, and his desires to save us. That is grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And again, here we have grace and faith separated by only one word. You are saved by grace, or, or no, a grace separated by a sentence. Saved and faith are separated by one word. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Okay? Grace is the mode, faith is the vessel. It's, it's so. They're, they're so related and, and married together, you can't separate one without the other. Um, but verse, verses 6 and 7 back here talked about the immeasurable riches, verse 7. Immeasurable riches. And so often when we read the, the parables and the gospels and it starts talking about, you know, a man had a treasure stored up or whatever. And if, if you do the you do the math. I love doing that when, when it says so many of this type of coin and you think, oh, I bet that was a lot of money back then. But you have no realization. One of my favorite ones, I think it was in the Gospel of, of Luke, uh, it was talking about a silver coin and, and how much silver it would have been. And I realized if you did the math to account for inflation, it was enough silver to fill this whole sanctuary. You know, So just, just a little bit. And that, that, that amount of money was talking about the debt that we owe God to keep out of hell, right? You can't pay it. It's not an amount of money that you can pay. It's not an amount of money that someone like Elon Musk or Bill Gates could just come up with and say, okay, I'm going to buy my way into heaven. When, when God talks about riches, it's immeasurable. It's beyond what we can fathom. And it's almost always, when God talks about riches, it's almost always in relation to the value of heaven and that you can't afford to buy into it. Verse 8 continues, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. And that's, that's a big part of what grace is, is the idea that it is a gift, right? It is free. And so you take an immeasurable amount of money, can't even begin to purchase something, and then you have God who says, you know what? Don't worry about the cost. It's on me. It's for you. I also am reminded and think of often when I think of the word grace. There was a time when my wife and I were in seminary, or I was in seminary. We lived in Minnesota, and um, we were uh, renting a house, and, and she had... I think it was when she was still working for a church and she had at one point she she quit her job at the church and became a nanny but but it was somewhere in there and I was trying to work between one and two jobs and be a full-time student at seminary and I was trying to pay the bills you know and um, and I remember that it was getting really really tight and we looked at each other one day and we're like it's our normal time to go to the grocery store but there's nothing left to, to go to the grocery store with and within, within a minute of us having that conversation, our doorbell rang. 
and we went to the door, and it was somebody from our church. It happened to be like the week before Thanksgiving. Somebody from our church had like four grocery sacks, four groceries, and a turkey. And they said, we added you to our list for the you know, Thanksgiving food baskets because we thought you might appreciate this. And, and, and that is the type of picture of grace that God wants us to understand. He has us covered. And it's in his nature to cover us, to take care of us. It's not something that we did to earn it. It's not something you do to earn it. It is a gift. It is a free gift. It's not like one of those gifts that family members give each other, you know? I'll spend $30 on your Christmas present, and then I'll evaluate how much you, if you spent five on mine, then next year, I'm going to remember this, right? You're not getting near as much next year. No, God gives freely and lavishes us upon us his grace. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus Four good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right, Steve? Yep. But but this this verse, it, it's very, very hard for a good Lutheran pastor to be talking about grace and how God's salvation is a free gift and then include this verse because then it says you're supposed to go work for it, right? No, you are not supposed to go work for it. The, the works are not a repayment for the gift which God has given you. And we're going to talk about that in two weeks where it's glory to God alone that in our life, we live it, we give glory to God in what we do, okay? Now, I'm going to move on from Ephesians to Romans chapter 5, and, and I'll, I'll give you a little hint. Every once in a while, I do something silly because I have different ways of preparing messages, but when it's a topical thing like this about grace, I, sometimes I will degrade myself all the way down to Google and I will type into Google something like, verses that talk about grace. How many of you could do that? I mean, I don't know if you would have come up with that or not. But um, I, I freely admit, sometimes I do that. And then as I was going through a very long list of verses, I was like, you know, a lot of these are coming out of Romans chapter 5. This section and that section and this section and that section. And so I... Um, I made my message a little more succinct, succinct by, by looking. We're going to look at Romans chapter 5 here. Um, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. The word grace isn't in there yet, but the fact that we are justified, and that justification is by faith, um, and we just read, for by grace you have been saved through faith, so we know there's this connection between faith and grace, um, and that connection is made here in Romans chapter 5 by how we are justified. And um, the word justified can mean so many different things, but I want you to think of the, the good, uh, the easy theological understanding of what it means. Just as if I'd never sinned. Justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. So, because Christ died on the cross for your sins, when the Father looks at you thinking, should I let this sinner into heaven? He doesn't see the sinner. He sees the perfection from his son, just as if I'd never sinned. It speaks of the mode, again, of our salvation. Um, therefore, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans is a big one about this peace with God understanding. And in order to let it sink in, we have to remember and recognize, remember that sin nature we were talking about? It, it really creates this thing, we think of it as a war between mankind and God. We're, we were at war with each other. And, and Christ, in, God ends the war by sending Christ to die for our and all of a sudden, the war is made peace. The war has stopped. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. What was wrong with the world has been made right. The relationship between man and God has been fixed. 
Wouldn't that be nice? Any of you who have a spouse ever get in an argument with your spouse? And, and, and yeah. <clears throat> when it gets fixed, when, when the I'm sorry's and I'll try to never do that again and, and I, I know I was wrong, so all those things come out and the I love you's come out. The relationship is restored. And, and like I'd like to talk about like when we do premarital counseling and stuff, relationships after arguments come out stronger uh, because you learn how to reconcile with one another. And our relationship with God, when we recognize our sin and we start working on that, it, 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 it's a beautiful, there, there's something about the relationship between a husband and a wife that teaches us about the relationship between mankind and God and, and how when we recognize that God loves us regardless of our sin, that that, that is this picture of grace. Okay. Verse 2, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So access, and I'm, again, this is something for next week because it said by faith, access. So think of a door, right? How do you get access to the other side of the door. You, you gotta turn the knob and open it and walk through it, right? Faith is the access to the grace which we are in. The grace, dumb it down again, God's riches at Christ's expense, the, the, the fact that God loves us so much that he would give his only son to die for us. That, that love is the grace that we are talking about. That verse continues, through him we also have but also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. In verse 3, not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. I looked something up just a second ago. Let's see, because that passage there always reminds me of this, Yoda. You guys remember Yoda from Star Wars? He was talking about kind of the opposite of this, and that was in not Christian theology, but in the force and all of that from Star Wars mythology, folklore, whatever you want to call it. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate, and hate leads to suffering. That was Yoda, right? Paul gives us this. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. And, and what a beautiful description that God has given us, and George Lucas tried to, I don't know if George Lucas looked at this verse when he wrote that, but, you know, he turned it upside down and, and made it evil. But here we have hope that does not put us to shame. And when you read the word shame, especially in the New Testament, um, I'm, you know, I'm reminded of when I was a kid, shame on you was a big thing. Uh, Karen was always reminding me of, of how in her family growing up, she would say um, uh, that was a big thing from parents to children was, you are not to bring shame upon this family, right? Did I get that right? Don't bring shame upon this family. But shame, when you read it in the New Testament, is a little bit different, okay? It's the idea, if you're not going to be ashamed, that you should always think of it in an ap apocalyptic sense. When you go to heaven, when you die, and God lets you in, you're not going to be ashamed of the fact that you lived your life as a Christian trusting in Jesus Christ. The atheist who rejected Christ, when he gets up there and God says, I'm not letting you in, they're going to be ashamed. That's, that's the meaning behind the word shame when you see it in the New Testament. Because God's love 
has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I love these descriptive words like the Holy Spirit, the idea that God's love is poured out. And then there, I think that's in Corinthians, it talks about, you know, if you have a cup and God's, what God gives you as good stuff, his grace is poured into this cup and it's pressed down and it's overflowing. It can't be contained. There's so much. It's immeasurable. It's a, it's a beautiful, good gift. Poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That these, are, these are faith words, right? Poured by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. I, I, I see those verses and I, I see baptism. You know, water is poured out. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given. Faith is instilled and we grow in Christ. Verse 6, For while we were still weak and at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God, another holy but, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, not deserving it. At a time when we were failing the most, God sent his son to die for us. God's riches at Christ's expense. Uh, verse 9, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Um, we've been justified. It has happened. I, I, I love the, the question that goes um, something like, do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember that moment when, when you realized that, well, all this meant that God died for your sins? What was the date and time? I don't know. Some people that's important, other people it isn't. For me, it's before my memory, right? But, but the date and time for everyone, whether you know it or not, is about 2,000 years ago when Christ died on the cross for your sins. We all, as Christians, have that in common. Okay, verse 10 continues. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more that now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. If, if a bad person can cause bad things to happen to the entire world, most certainly a good person can cause good things that can have effects for the whole world. And this is, this is going to get put into even more descriptive, beautiful understanding for us here as Romans chapter 5 continues. Christ is the mode, he is the means of our reconciliation. How we were made right with God, it all focuses on Christ and what he did, and the fact that God was willing to send Christ to do that, to send Jesus to do that, that is grace. So verse 12 continues, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so also death spread to all men, because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Okay, that's a lot, but, but let's simplify it down. Adam sinned, right? Everyone after Adam inherited sin nature. I, I think science and sin go hand in hand here. It, it, it's an inherited, I don't know, the Bible doesn't talk about gene traits or whatnot, but I, I look at this as, as in, in my mind, how I understand how we inherit sin we inherit it genetically. We're, we're genetic sinners. We fall short of God's glory because of that. Jesus, his father was God, not Joseph, right? So he's outside of that genetic inheritance. Even though the Bible doesn't talk about genetics, the Bible does say that's, we're, we've inherited it. It is, and I, I just said that wrong. The Bible does talk about it because the Bible uses the word seed a lot in, in describing this through one man's seed. So there, there's the argument for that, okay? And then it says, this one man, Adam, was a type of the one who was to come. 
when you see that idea that it's a type, it's looking forward to somebody else, in this case, Jesus Christ, the type, Adam is a type of Jesus. And, and the difference is, is in what Adam did, his one, effect, his one act, it affected all mankind, right? And so now we're going to look into the one act of Jesus Christ and how it can affect all mankind. Uh, verse 15 continues, much more have the grace of God, or no, and it's verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abundantly for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. So Adam's one act of sin resulted in a sin nature for everyone that affected everyone. Jesus's one act of selfless following the plan, going to the cross to, to die for our sins has made it so that all mankind can receive the gift that Jesus paid the price for according to the plan of the Father in heaven. Again, another holy but. Judgment following one tr trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. Um, there, there was a, a way of studying the Bible years ago. I think the Jews maybe still use it. It was, it was called rabbinic midrash, okay? And, and they had rules for how they could interpret different passages. And when they saw something, they put a label to it, and then they taught it under that label. This is called ad minorum ad majorum. That's Latin. The Hebrew word was kalwahomer. I don't know why I tell you that stuff. I find those words interesting but it means what is true in a lesser case is most certainly true in a greater case. If Adam can make it so that we all deserve to die and go to hell because of our sin nature, most certainly Jesus dying on the cross for our sins makes it so all can come to him to receive the free gift of grace that is heaven, that is accomplished by faith into the, the gift that we stand, right? Okay, verse 18, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. Okay, ad minorum, ad majorum. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Can't say, I mean... Paul says it over and over here. I feel like I can't say it enough times. Jesus and what he did on the cross for you, the gift of grace that he did is, is for us to receive. It's open up. And it is not only sufficient, but it is complete. Verse 20. Now the law came in to increase, the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, Grace abounded all the more. Uh, again, um, as this passage began, from Adam to Moses, there wasn't a written law, right? There was just the, pack, the fact that God's people had fallen short and through nature they should know right from wrong. And then the law was written. And um, some would say, once the law was written, I don't know, would it be harder or easier to follow the law once it was written? But the idea is, is you knew better about whether you were sinning or not. And some would say, I should go sin more so that I get more grace. And we'll talk about that in two weeks with giving glory to God alone, right? But <clears throat> that is not Paul's point. And he goes on to that in other areas of Romans as well. Uh, verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
grace. Grace is a gift. It is freedom from the war that separates man from God. It is peace. It has to be free. There is no cost associated with grace because if there was a cost, we would not be able to afford it. It can't be associated with a work because if there was a work, you would not be able to earn it. It cannot be associated with a test because if it was associated with a test, you would fail. It is free in all respects of the word free. There are no strings attached. It is who God is. It is grace. True understanding of what God's love is becomes revealed in God's plan for salvation for the world. And, and grace it is grace is yeah, it is God's riches at Christ's expense. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that it is by grace alone that we are saved. For any other way, we would screw up. And, and we thank you that you know us well enough to know that. And even knowing that we would fail in all ways, even knowing we don't deserve it, you sent your son to die for our sins. And so we thank you so much for that gift of grace alone. We pray this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Let us sing together hymn number 407, Jesus Paid It All. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let's sing together hymn number 578, Amazing Grace.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Um.